Blog Talk Radio. There's a call comes ringing for the restless waves. Stand the light, stand the light, stand the light. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to the Gospel Light radio show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler, with my co-host, Tim Bent, from the state of Texas, Glenn McMillian, from the state of Texas, Courtney Carruthers, from the state of Illinois, Steve Cordo, from the state of Florida, Willie Williams III, from the state of Texas, Clay Williams, from the state of Georgia, Brian Christian Coleman, from the state of New Jersey, and Robert Lee Johnson, from the state of Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful that you're tuning in to our radio broadcast this evening. This radio show is being brought to you by loving and faithful members of the Churches of Christ. We ask you to take out your Bibles and study along with us. We have a very exciting show planned for your spiritual enlightenment. And your edification, if you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, you can give me a call to the live show at 713-955-0508. If you have any questions or comments for any of my co-hosts on the show this evening, you can give me, send me emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com. Or you can give me a call to, at Stevie B's Media Production Studios at 910 910- Four nine one six four zero five. Now again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. If you need any assistance in locating a congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, get out your Bibles and stay along with us here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. Good evening, wherever you are in the world listening to this radio broadcast. Stevie B's Media Production presents the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler, and this radio show is being broadcast from Stevie B's Media Production Studio in the great state of North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just grateful for the privilege to bring you a program where we as Christians and members of the churches of Christ can share our faith and preach and teach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ on a weekly basis. So before we go into our program for this evening, I would ask that you would bow with me in a word of prayer that we may thank God for this opportunity. Our most kind, gracious, loving, heavenly Father, the Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast and we are prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, we pray that you will be with my co-host, Tim Bench and Steve Cordo on the show this evening as they break unto us the bread of life. And Father, we pray that you will bless their families that are supporting their efforts as they continue to sow the seed of the kingdom. Father, we pray that you will bless our listeners who are tuning in this evening through Blog Talk Radio, as well as through social media. We pray that they may listen well and that their hearts may be pricked as they consider their eternal stance before you and their soul salvation. And it will cause them to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much. For sending your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to die such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. For we recognize that without such a sacrifice, we would not even have a hope of eternal life. Father, even now, we ask that you would forgive us for the transgressions of our own heart. We know that our flesh is weak and we often fall short of your will. Father, we pray you continue to bless us, keep us and love us all the days of our lives. And if we have been faithful unto death, Father, we pray that you would save us. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning into the broadcast. Our speakers for this evening will, in the first segment, my co-host Tim Bench. He serves with the Oham Lane Church of Christ there in Abilene, Texas. He'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ. And we will not have a shouted out question on the show this evening, so we'll just have two speakers 
And my, in the last segment, my co-host, Tim Steve Cordo. He serves as the evangelist with the Central Church of Christ there in Monticello, Florida. He'll be making this proclamation of the gospel of Christ to close out the show. So open up your Bibles now and open your minds, and let's have a great show. After the break, the next voice you hear will be that of my co-host, Tim Bench. Enjoy the show. Oh, it's and rain okay, just sit down. Now. Man. Sit down, sit down. Let me talk to you. Can be it's been a while, but I know trouble's been the in your life. Well, the devil's trying to mess with you. But God's trying to bless you. Situations yeah. they cause you to question faith. I know you cry and you work. But we came to take you the whole long. Hold on, Try your eyes. I'm a believer. Jesus still delivers. I remember oh. when I was right there. This is what I have to do. I called on Jesus. I prayed. I called on him. And we know that for those 
those who love I don't have to cry All things oh. work together for good For you Who are called according to his purpose It's alright You are listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show Now my co-host Tim Bench and his subject Legalism Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our show tonight. As Stevie mentioned, my name is Tim Bench, and I'm calling in tonight from Abilene, Texas, and we are so thankful that you have decided to spend some time with us this evening. We always hope that the lessons presented here will be educational, beneficial, and most of all, scriptural uh, in their content. I want to start off tonight's lesson with a quote from Dub McClish from his article, Legalism or Love, and this ties in directly with what our topic will be for the evening. Quote, those who do not want to obey the teachings of the New Testament often accuse those of legalism who dare emphasize obedience to God's commands. Legalism is defined as strict or excessive conformity to the law. In the religious context, this definition refers to God's law. One who truly loves the Lord should consider it a compliment to be called a legalist by the foregoing definition. It is impossible to practice excessive conformity to God's laws. As long as it is the law of God, one is determined to preach and to practice. Often, people use the term legalist to refer to some who overemphasize one part of God's law to the neglect of others or those who elevate a human opinion to the level of divine law. In these senses, the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' time were legalists, Matthew 15, 3, Matthew 15, 6 through 9, and Matthew 23, 23. Some of the same types of legalists are around even today, and they ought to be exposed and condemned per Jesus' example. However, a clear distinction needs to be made between the foregoing loose usage of legalism and the scriptural doctrine of obedience to the commands of the gospel. Insistence upon obedience dare not be equated with legalism, for God has ever required obedience of mankind. From the beginning, disobedience has equaled sin, and it still does. 1 John 3, verse 4, and 1 John 5, 17. Salvation by Christ is not available short of obedience, Hebrews 5, verse 9, and a fiery judgment awaits those who know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. There's much more. New Testament teaching makes love of Christ and obedience to him inseparable. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He that loveth me not keepeth not my words if you keep my commandments you shall abide in my love for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments john 14:15 john 14:24 john 15 verse 10 and 1 john 5 verse teaches that the commands of christ are unessential to salvation meaning only believe and ask jesus to come into your heart and you will be saved does not love Christ regardless of his claims to the contrary. This is the crucial place where the faith-only salvation doctrine breaks down. A person may believe in Christ and still refuse to obey him for lack of love. For instance, those who say, Lord, Lord, Matthew 7, 21, the rulers in John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, the demons in James chapter 2, verse 9, etc., all such mere believers will be lost, Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Let it be clearly understood that it is legalism in its most basic sense to insist upon careful obedience to Christ. And let those who emphasize the essentiality of strict obedience not be ashamed to be called legalists. Love of Christ demands just such legalism. This matter relates to the faithful service we should render in Christ's kingdom also. I have watched in dismay through the years as some Christians seek other things first beside the kingdom, Matthew 6, verse 33. On a given Lord's Day, there will be some who choose to stay in bed, 
go fishing or hunting, visit relatives, or just stay home with little or no thought of their duty to Christ. Do they no longer believe in Christ? Oh, they may still believe in a very shallow sense, but they have a very serious love problem. They need to actually become legalists, end quote. One other citation before we get started from Vaughn Schaffner from Liberty or License. This is from the January 29th, 1970 issue of Gospel Guardian uh, in regard to the term legalist. Quote, the school of the liberal is the hotbed for thoughts which produce the mistaken idea that authoritative laws are the real enemies of religious freedom. Holding to the tenets of Christ's doctrine as binding is described as slavish or overlaying the spirit of Christianity or arrogant. To value authoritative means of doing all good works is individually declared to be setting a value on the way above the soul and life of man as though the persons who care for one must therefore neglect the other. These liberals take pride in emphasizing that authoritative edicts are restraint upon thought, but their notion of liberty is impossible. An intelligent being is free when he moves without difficulty in the realm assigned him by makeup. Truth is originally the native element of thought, and Christ's will prescribes the direction and limits of truth concerning God and his relation to man. Being true, the New Testament should be stated authoritatively. To accept Christ's word as being truth, one is not at liberty to deny it. One cannot accept it as truth and then desire such liberty, nor can one be loyal to truth and at the same time ignore or defy it. When one has discovered a fact of experience, he is not at liberty to deny it, and concerning it, he forfeits his intellectual independence by the discovery. The religion without restraining laws, is infidel, if not atheistic. Submission is not slavery. Obedience is the school of freedom. In obeying the conditions of Christ's will, we are freed from cruel yet petty despotisms, which enslave the rebel heart, and in obeying the revealed laws of God to man, we obtain freedom and also moral royalty. If man is royal in his rule over the things about him, the highest exercise of sovereignty is over himself. The liberal who imagines freedom to consist in repudiation of all authority destroys the foundation of moral and spiritual greatness by destroying its very fundamental law. Liberals teach a doctrine which is inconsistent with the first condition of the greatest liberty enjoyed because, in effect, they prescribe the privilege of a free submission to truth, end quote. Tonight, one of the increasingly common accusations toward both church members as well as entire congregations at times is that people are behaving in a legalistic manner. And we've seen the definition and the background of that term, as if attempting to follow the commands or doctrines or laws of the New Testament is somehow optional or even immoral. Such accusations are often accompanied by comparison, as we've seen, to the Pharisees. And those are often followed by dialogues about, well, we live under grace now. Keeping the commands of Jesus Christ himself has somehow become archaic. In short, we are not saved by works, we're often told, or we don't have to do anything since the grace of Jesus covers us. Since this anti-legalistic viewpoint seems to be more and more prevalent in today's churches, it would behoove each of us to have a thorough understanding of what legalism actually is and what it is not. Perhaps most importantly, is legalism, meaning to attempt to obey biblical commands, somehow a sin? Do we actually sin by trying to obey what Jesus Christ says in the New Testament? And there are people who would say, yes, that's actually a sin. I can't help but wonder what Church of Christ leaders just a generation or two back would think of a society where attempting to follow the commands of the New Testament and attempting to follow the commands of Jesus Christ himself has somehow become sinful, but that is the situation that we face today. More importantly, I cannot fathom what Jesus would think of those who claim to follow him but we'll turn around and argue that actually obeying him is mere legalistic thinking. First, it is important to note that legalism is a word which does not appear in Scripture. 
The official definition of legalism, according to Webster's, is a, quote, strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to a religious or moral code. My former preacher uh, argued that legalism would be an attempt to garner or acquire salvation through a perfect and flawless keeping of the law, in other words, gaining salvation through perfect keeping of all biblical laws and New Testament laws. From Defining Legalism by David McClister, quote, Legalism seems to be like a poem. No one can seem to define it, but everyone thinks they know it when they see it. However, it may surprise you to know that the English word legalism itself was not coined until 1645. Even more importantly, there is no Hebrew or Greek word in the entire Bible that even means legalism. This latter fact is seldom appreciated. In all of the debates that Paul had with Judaizing teachers and all the responses he had to their teachings, not once did he ever call them legalists. Why not? Because of the simple reason that every Jew, including Jesus, Paul, the Pharisees, the Judaizers, believed that a person's works, his deeds, his obedience to God, was without a doubt part of the right relationship with God within Judaism that was never at issue. No Jew in that day and age debated whether or not works were part of right, being right with God. Everyone agreed that they were. It was only after Martin Luther came up with his doctrine of faith only that the modern idea of legalism was born. Ever since that time, it has been common to refer to people who emphasize obedience to God in deeds or works, which are demanded by God's word, as legalists, end quote. From BibleStudyTools.com, and this gives us some background again on the term legalism. Quote, the term legalism commonly denotes preoccupation with form at the expense of substance. While it is now used metaphorically in all areas of human life, it appears to have had a theological origin in the 17th century when Edward Fisher used it to designate one who bringeth the law into the case of justification, end quote. And from Ron Hallbrook with Truth Magazine back in April 1975, quote, Denominations have charged gospel preachers with legalism for generations. During the 1800s, those who pled for a return to the ancient gospel without addition or subtraction were charged with legalism and neglect of God's grace. The Campbellite system of legalism is criticized as being based on the motivation of fear. A man would be a fool not to fear hell, but that does not mean that he does not love God when he obeys the gospel. If the scheme of redemption arouses fear of the consequences of continuing in sin, much more does it arouse love for deliverance from those consequences. Still, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit has preserved many approved examples and warning men against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, Romans chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Gospel preaching, which includes such warnings, is considered legalism by those who have a denominational concept of the gospel, end quote. Astonishingly, there are now churches of Christ today which actually promote themselves, this is part of their marketing campaigns, as being non-legalistic. From the Pasadena Church of Christ in Pasadena, California, this is from their website, quote, We are a more progressive church of Christ that is gender inclusive. We try to live out our Christian walk without the legalism and fundamentalism that has given so many churches of Christ a bad name. We want a second chance to live out our calling in a fresh way that is enlivened by God's Holy Spirit, diligently trying to follow him. This is a definition that I was supplied by Howard uh, Daniel Denham, of the, formerly of the Truth Bible Institute. Quote, the term legalism is often misused as a broad brush against even strict obedience to commands. Liberalism, which advocates liberating people from the necessity of obedience virtually to any standard or any rule of conduct, the basic definition of law, uses the term as an ad hominem or an insult against those who teach the necessity of obedience. Because of the wide misuse of the term as well as the misapplied references to the Pharisees, 
regarding the same, it has come to be accepted that obedience equals being legalistic, which is simply false, end quote. From Foy Wallace, then and now, this is from Cecil Willis, quote, a liberal, whether in politics, economics, or religion, is simply one that liberally interprets and elastically applies the prescribed authority. Our liberal brethren are very lenient and flexible in their use of God's word, fearing lest someone should think of them to be a legalist, a binder of the letter of the divine law. But the gospel is law, which must be kept, according to James 1, verse 25, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, 2 John 9. Thus, the liberals among us deny the essentiality of following Bible patterns and the binding power of Bible examples, end quote. So again, I think we can see how quickly this dissolves into being problematic, where you ha literally have Christians who are arguing that we follow Christ, but we really don't have to follow Christ. From Ron Hallbrook with The Guardian of Truth, quote, men who used to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints now earnestly defend denominational doubts, dodges, and dogmas on baptism, Jude 3, as these sweet-spirited spoles gradually granulate into sugar, they have temper tantrums and go into tirades, crying out against legalism. A legalist, in their eyes, is someone who insists, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, verse 11. Legalists emphasize that only the baptized are saved from their past sins by the blood of Christ in the gospel age, and only those immersed are truly baptized, and only those who know its purpose is remission of sins received Bible baptism. There's much talk by these apostates about searching for common ground, and they are always finding more and more of it with their denominational neighbors, and less and less of it with their brethren who insist upon a thus saith the Lord for all things, end quote. I want to make one point abundantly clear tonight. None of us will ever be perfect. None of us will ever earn our salvation. None of us will ever be good enough to merit heaven based solely upon the good actions or inactions or our own deeds, etc. We're told from the Bible that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. This is a verse that all serious-minded Christians are familiar with, and it proves the inherent sinful nature of man. So, by definition, if I am a sinful and flawed being, and I am, any application of biblical studies should enable me to learn quickly that my salvation is not predicated on my own deeds. Grace or mercy from God Almighty thus is an absolute and complete requirement for my salvation. I know of no one, even those who are or have been accused of legalism, who would argue this point. So the absurdity of the argument that legalists try to earn their way into heaven is revealed. Let's look at several biblical facts and statements directly from the Bible in regard to legalism. Jesus Christ laid out numerous commands, both explicit and inferred throughout the New Testament. For example, we are to observe all things Jesus commanded as per Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. The question, am I thus being legalistic in trying to do precisely what the scripture says for me to do? Am I being legalistic in trying to follow the commands of Jesus Christ himself? Jesus himself might be accused of legalism by some nowadays. After all, Jesus repeatedly emphasized and taught the importance of absolute trust in what God has said. You can reference Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Matthew 5, 17 through 18, John 5, 46, and so on. Jesus also stressed our need to obey the Holy Scriptures, John 14, 15, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. If adherence and obedience to the words of Jesus were not to be followed or followed closely, why do such verses suggest otherwise? Was Jesus simply speaking in hyperbole, as some would nowadays argue? How can Jesus issue commands for us to follow if following said commands is pointless 
and negates grace in the first place. Jesus was obviously fully aware of God's infinite, all-encompassing, awe-inspiring mercy, but yet Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, directly linked salvation with obeying the Word of God. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, this is Jesus himself speaking, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 51, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. If Jesus Christ stressed that obeying the Gospels was an indispensable facet of salvation, how could I possibly argue or suggest otherwise? The New Testament does not condemn the strict keeping of the obedience of God. Observing and obeying New Testament commands is, in fact, commended. Even the Pharisees, who are the example upon whom accusations of legalism are usually based, and this is important, were not condemned for keeping God's commandments too well. They were condemned for keeping some requirements while leaving off other ones, probably obeying the less strenuous or difficult ones, as many people seem to do today as well. We all know people who like to cherry-pick verses. Yes, I'll follow that one, I'll ignore that one, and so on. What did Jesus tell them? Jesus told them that they should have kept both. They should have kept the difficult ones and the not difficult ones. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23 these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. The Pharisees certainly had their flaws, as we know, and their shortcomings, but their specific sin in this specific context, an, exa an example, was not what the anti-legalist would argue today. If legalism means strict adherence to God's law, then Jesus and his apostles were also legalists. Jesus' apostles commanded obedience. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter states, we ought to obey God rather than men. A famous verse from Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be condemned. Again, simply from that verse, we are told that there are things that we have to do. End of story. Note that we are to obey God. This directly infers action. And the necessity of baptism, which is certainly worth a study of its own, is by definition physical action on the part of the person wanting to become a Christian. The act of baptism is emphasized again when the men in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, they ask Peter and the other apostles, they say, what shall we do? Peter does not say, oh, you don't have to do anything. You're covered by grace. You don't have anything to worry about. No. Peter replies with not just one but two commands. He says to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So in short, we ought to take note of the verse which tells us, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ from 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 8. Simply stated, there are commands that we as Christians are required to obey, period. Anti-legalists often will make this argument. Well, we don't live under the old law, or there's no law now but grace instead. So, should Paul have therefore never threatened the vengeance of God for those who disobey the gospel of Christ, Romans 12, verse 19. Should he have preached simply God's grace and love and ignored all the unpleasant parts? A direct question, was Paul in error? Was Paul wrong? And in today's PC and often touchy-feely, offend-no-one type world, there are those who would say that Paul was in error for a host of reasons, legalism certainly being one of those reasons. The New Testament doctrine of Christ taught Christians to engage in a wide array of actions and activities. Here are some examples. This could include meeting every first day of the week in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and Hebrews 10, verse 25. Remembering the Lord's death, 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26. To reprove, 
rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, Second Timothy four verses two through six. To sing to the Lord, Ephesians five nineteen, Matthew twenty six verse chapter fourteen verse twenty six, and so on. And to remain faithful unto death to the commandments of the Lord, Revelation two verse ten. The examples are lengthy. We could go on all night with examples. Second John nine reads whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of christ does not have god he who abides in the doctrine of christ has both the father and the son all of the examples that we have just talked about are new to or where new testament christians are commanded and expected to participate in certain actions and to follow certain actions so if the anti-legalists are correct, then Christians no longer have to follow the above laws, and they could therefore live precisely as the rest of the world lives, and they could depend on grace and grace alone to save them. According to some, the apostles were legalists, as we have seen, and they were not to be followed. So were Christ and his apostles thus mistaken for forbidding anyone to commit adultery? and fornication, and homosexuality, Matthew 19, verse 9, Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. Was Jesus himself being legalistic for demanding obedience to the law and to avoid those specific sexual sins? Again, physical actions, either positive or negative, are works, the argument goes. So by definition, those works become legalistic efforts. We cannot be saved or lost by what we do or do not do. I was told just about a week ago on Facebook, so much of the New Testament was by definition idle words and worthless letters. If Christ was a legalist, should we not strive to be? Christ is our perfect example to follow and to emulate. Think about the following. And again, these are specific quotes. These are the actual words of Jesus himself who never once gave a warning that included the term legalism, and he certainly did have things to say about obedience to him. John 15, verses 13 and 14, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Second John 6, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. John 15, verse 10, Jesus again speaking, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. First John chapter 2, verse 3, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. First John 2, 4, He that keeps not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. This is a theme that Jesus repeats over and over and over throughout the New Testament. The absolute necessity of obedience to uh, the gospel and, and what is provided, the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 2, you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 2, verses 3 through 5, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commands. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. Listeners tonight should note, again, the frequency with which the word command or commandment appears regarding the words of Jesus himself. The Greek word for commandment in the New Testament is the word intole. That's from Strong's Concordance Entry 1785, it is defined as an order, a command, a charge, a precept, or an injunction, end quote. This is a citation I want to share from H.E. Phillips on law and legalism. Quote, 
let us understand the meaning of the words legal and legalist and legalism. Legal means that which is authorized or permitted by law. Legalism is that system which holds strict literal adherence to law. Legalist is one who accepts the strict and literal obedience to law. If legalism is wrong and evil, all law ought to be rejected, and iniquity becomes a virtue. Whoever requires obedience to the law of Christ promotes division and fosters callous hearts. That is the consequence of this plea for abandonment of the New Testament law as the revelation from God to save the obedient believer in Jesus Christ, end quote. I have a citation I want to share very quickly as we close this lesson. This is from The Wicked Cry Legalism by Al Shannon. I think this makes several fantastic points that we need to consider. Quote, the Pharisees trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. They supposed their self-imposed purity had earned them salvation. This led to Pharisees to devise human plans and traditions to get around the parts of God's law which they did not desire to keep, Matthew 15, 1 through 9, and to compare themselves to sinners worse than themselves rather than to the perfect standard of the law of God, Luke 18, verse 11. In contrast, our righteousness must be the result of merciful pardon from a gracious Father, Romans 3, verses 21 through 28, as we humbly recognize our own guilt of sin and submit to God's will. Without this righteousness, by pardon, as the result of humble, trusting, obedience, we cannot be saved, for this is the requirement for entrance into the kingdom of God, Matthew 5, verse 20. It's hard to look at the Pharisees and see anything good. However, Jesus said of the Pharisees to his own disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, they observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say, and they do not do. Now, this one phrase undermines that the Pharisees had nothing good about them that we should emulate today. The apostle Paul was a self-proclaimed Pharisee and was not bashful about expressing such. His own words, my manner from, of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know they knew me from the first, that they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived the Pharisee. Yes, the Pharisees said and did not. However, they taught the letter of the law. What was condemned concerning the Pharisees was not their strictness of the law, it was their disobedience of the law. It was their man-made traditions that they used to replace the law of God. Our righteousness must excel that of the scribes and Pharisees. How is this? By strict obedience to the law of God in both teaching and practice. Romans 2, 21 and 22. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. Colossians 3, verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5, specifically, who can turn to the gospel of Christ and say that we are at liberty to disobey it or to change it or teach it differently than the apostles taught? Who can turn to the doctrine of Christ and change it or not abide in it? Who can turn to the worship of God and say that we can do it differently than that which was delivered by the Spirit according to the truth of God, end quote. I want to close tonight with what I think is the summation of this entire lesson. This was from Bill Banowski. This was from the, uh, taken from the Abilene Christian College lectures back in 1955. Quote, some of the preachers in the recent liberal movement have said the same thing of verbal inspiration of the scriptures. They say that such a doctrine is legalistic and literalistic. May I suggest as kindly and as possible and as strongly as I know how. There is no New Testament passage or principle which indicates that God is concerned over the possibility of our studying and following too closely the exact meaning of the words of the New Covenant. There is every indication that God would have us study every word, 
every line, every syllable, and try and translate such teachings as they are found into daily living, end quote. Tonight, living your life as best you can, attempting to obey the laws and the commands of the New Testament is not sinful, despite what a growing number of opponents would tell you. James chapter 2, verse 17 tells us specifically that thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Works and actions and obedience to the commands of both the apostles as well as Jesus Christ himself are not optional. They are not old-fashioned. They are not archaic. And most of all, they are not to be ignored. And espousing charges of legalism versus those striving with all their might to live as Jesus is instructed is in essence of denial of Jesus as our Messiah and Savior himself. And that argument, again, is in direct conflict with numerous passages from the New Testament. We're going to close there tonight. Again, I hope this provides everyone with a framework to understand what the term legalism means and how that's used as an ad hominem uh, attack and a source of insults. And again, what the New Testament actually tells us about obedience. And I, again, I hope that this lesson, along with all of our lessons here, are always educational and beneficial to all of our listeners. We strive to use the Bible as the source of what we teach here. And again, the Bible, the New Testament, is very specific in the fact that we are expected, we are demanded, we are commanded to obey what is given to us in the New Testament. And if that is legalism, then by all means, I welcome and embrace the charge of being told that I am a legalist. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I'll turn this back over to Stevie. And if there's ever any questions or comments or anything that we can address from any of our listeners, please submit those, and we would be happy to address those. Thank you so much. Good night. It ain't easy. No. Sometimes it gets hard down here, Lord. Sometimes it gets rough. So rough, so rough. Sometimes it gets tough for me. Has anybody been lonely? All by yourself Has anybody been sad Broken hearted and sad Have you even been mad Oh You had to cry all night long I know it's hard but what you need
the Gospel Light Radio Show. Stay tuned for the announcements. Is your congregation in need of lending for a building or expansion project? As your partner and advocate, Diversified Financial Network will take the time to understand your unique situation and develop a financing solution that meets your specific needs. It's an exciting time for your congregation, and what you need is a company with expertise in church financing early in the process. Call us today at 1-866-513-6665 or visit us at www.diversifiedfinancegroup.com. These are the announcements for the events and activities in the Churches of Christ. If you'd like to have your events and activities announced on this broadcast, please contact me at Stevie B's Media Production Studios at 910-491-6405. Due to the pandemic, the coronavirus outbreak, I will not be making any announcements for any public gatherings or assemblies, but I will be making announcements regarding the events and activities here on social media. On Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, and 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there will be a nationwide gospel call that is sponsored by the Church of Christ in Highland Heights from Houston, Texas. And the telephone number is 857-216-6700. And the access code is 328497. And this is a nationwide outreach to those who are not members of the Church of Christ. And the speakers will be presenting a basic salvation message for them to learn what they must do in order to be saved. And information about the Churches of Christ. In addition, it is intended to edify and strengthen the faith of those who are not Christians. On Tuesday, and this actually began on April the 28th, and it's been going every other Tuesday since, the Delcrest Church of Christ from San Antonio, Texas, presents a women's virtual Bible study at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And this uh, virtual Bible study has been held on Zoom, www.zoom.com. And the class ID number is 821-3692-8262. On Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Church of Christ Ministers presents a virtual sermon series 101, and the theme is Timeless Truth in Truthless Times. And this uh, session can be will be held live on Facebook and on YouTube. You can go to the YouTube channel, Somebody Must Come Preaching, and for more information, contact www.arlingtonroad.com. On a daily basis from 6 a.m. Central Standard Time, there will be a Ladies in Christ prayer line hosted by the Church of Christ in Lafayette, Louisiana. And that telephone number is 605-472-5203. And the access code is 514 On August the 21st through the 23rd, 2020, there will be the Feasting of the Word of God Empowerment Conference and the lesson text is uh, Psalms 34, verse 8, Present Living Royal Regal in Christ. And this will be a free virtually by WebEx and to register online to attend at website www.ladiesinchrist.org. And donations will be greatly appreciated. For more information, please call Mary Cobb, Mary Russell Cobb at 337-658-1269. Or send an email to prayer at ladiesinchrist.org. Seem to have lost my the last. I wanted to make an announcement regarding my co-host Steve Cordell. He has a new book called God's Grace and You, and this book can be ordered from the 21st Century Catalog. 
And this is a program reminder. Stevie B's Media Production presents. We're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio the first Monday of the month. That'll be August the 3rd, coming this uh, next week. My co host, Tim Bench. We have a special edition that we'll be doing here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. And my co host that just went off the air, Tim Bench. He should be scheduled to bring a lesson on this special edition show here. And that show will air from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then on Tuesday evening each week from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting a live show, What a Word from the Lord radio show. And each week we'll have a guest speaker from the Brotherhood of the Church of Christ who'll be presenting a lesson from the Word of God. Also, we have the Community Corner segment, and that's segments for small business owners and entrepreneurs who have products and services for our community. And also, my co-host, Lou Gibbons, from the Overbrook Park Church of Christ there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my co-host, Edward Bishop, from the Niagara Falls Church of Christ there in Niagara Falls, New York, will be presenting lessons from the Word of God on this broadcast. On August the 4th, we will not have a show scheduled on August the 4th. And on Thursday evening each week from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting a live show, the Gospel Light Radio Show, and I have eight co-hosts on this show who will be presenting lessons from the Word of God. And each week, uh, two of my co-hosts will be on the air with me. And I'm also taking questions from my shout-out platform on social media, Facebook, that I'll be posing to one of my co-hosts on this live show. And then on Friday evening, we have a new time from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'll be hosting a live show, Stevie B's Acapella Gospel Music Blast Radio Show, and I'll be playing some of the world's greatest acapella gospel music artists on that broadcast. We're also doing the Story Glory segment where I'm interviewing the artists that we're playing on that broadcast. And on this Friday night, tomorrow night, I'll be interviewing Cornelius for Strong Edwards from Galveston, Texas. We'll be debuting a new single from Cornelius on that broadcast. And we also have the Top 20 Countdown Show. Our next scheduled Top 20 Countdown Show for the month of August will be on August the 15th. And my on-demand episodes, if you can't catch any of these live shows, wherever you're getting your favorite podcast from, uh, there's just a variety of musical platforms out there. But the main platforms that uh, these shows can be found on are on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple iTunes, ACARadio.net, iWay Radio. Also on MCCBroadcasting.com, which these shows will air on Tuesday and Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, you can find these shows on YouTube, Ether, and coming soon to Pandora. And also on YouTube, you go to my YouTube channel, Stevie R. Butler, a.k.a. Stevie B. And also go to the Church TV Network and see their playlist, Acapella Radio. You'll be able to find all of these on-demand episodes. Also, I'd like to give a shout-out to all of my sponsors who are sponsoring these radio shows my sponsor, Sharon Norwood, she lives in Chicago, Illinois, and her company is called Organo, and her slogan is a health product for healthier living. And also my sponsor, Bethesda Memorial Funeral Director Crematory Services out of DeSoto, Texas, certainly appreciate them. And my sponsor, Stanley Phillips, he's the owner of A Touch of Class Apparel in Little Rock, Arkansas. And my sponsor, Diversified Financial Network, LLC, out of Dallas, Texas, the owner of Mark and Charlotte Carroll. And my sponsor is Cheryl Mirage. She lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. She's with the Compassion and Haiti Leaders. And she's been serving Northern Haiti for 20 plus years. And they invite you to become a part of something greater than yourself. So please visit and donate to Haiti at www.compassionatehaitileader.faith. And my sponsor, Yvonne Blazing Cracker Gooch. She's from Nashville, Tennessee. And I have two new sponsors. My sponsor, Melvin Jackson from High Point, North Carolina, and Marquise Hallman from Charlotte, North Carolina. Their company's called Unique Transportation Auto Car Hauling in Charlotte, North Carolina. And my sponsor is Stephanie Booker Wilson. She has the Stephanie Song Vocal Studio in Greensboro, North Carolina. So I appreciate all of my sponsors. The three E's of Stevie B's Media Productions. It is the objective of this broadcast. We want to educate, we want to edify, and we want to encourage you in a study of God's Word. 
And that will conclude our program announcements. You're listening to Speak to the Gospel Light radio show. Stay tuned. Light radio show. Now my co-host Steve Cordo and his subject, Cross Reference Your Preacher. And good evening, Stevie, and we are trying to go live on Facebook once again. So if you're watching on Facebook, welcome to the uh show this evening. And the topic that I chose for this evening I think is one that's pretty important for anyone who's been a church goer or who is at all um religiously inclined because we've all got to at some point or another learn to think for ourselves basically and when it comes to our religion i've got the uh powerpoints up on the uh, facebook if you're watching there's a slide here that says uh, with a man arriving at church and it says good morning sir welcome to first church would you like to leave your brain with me before you go in and that is the the idea that a lot of folks have 
when it comes to Christianity, that uh, when you walk into the church building, that uh, you, for whatever reason, have to check your brain at the door. And that is not the case. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, he came and spoke to them, to the disciples, that is, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. For make disciples of all nations. And then in Mark's account of the of that uh, great commission, he said, Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given to me. Go therefore and teach. Now, think a minute about how you teach. Nobody, or they, at least nobody should, whatever the teacher says when they come into the classroom, that they should uh, ask questions. Anytime you get taught anything, never be afraid to ask questions. Uh, if need be, get a second opinion. Now, when we go to the doctor and we hear something from the doctor that maybe we don't like or we question, I can go to another doctor and get a second opinion. But what do I do if I'm in a church and there's only one preacher? How do I get a second opinion? Uh, I don't have a, a second preacher to get for rebuttals or second opinions or, or anything like that. And if you don't agree with some part of the sermon, what do you do? Do you get online to uh, some seminary and leave? a message and ask them uh, for an opinion, this is where you've got to get your own second opinion. This is where you do not want to listen uh, to what the preacher says, but you want to question it. Uh, as careful as I study, and believe it or not, sometimes I can be wrong about things. And you need to cross-reference your preacher. A lot of our Bibles have got those neat center column references or footnotes in them where we can go and sometimes uh, for uh, for our questions, but that that's not going to always be enough. Sometimes we're going to have to dig a little deeper. Now, I remember and told you you had a lump uh, in uh, on your chest or in your head or something. It was not cancerous, and you shouldn't worry about it. But uh, you see, I'm sure signs of uh, doubt or lack of confidence in my diagnosis. No doubt you would want a second opinion from another uh, physician. So that's what we're going to look at this evening. Not cross-referencing your preacher, or as I subtitle it, get a second opinion. And if you have your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 17, where we are going to be starting. And the first verse, uh, it says, Now they had passed through uh, Amphilopolis and Amphilonia, and they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as was his custom, went in uh, to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. Notice, some of them were persuaded, not everybody. We're not going to persuade everybody. But then uh, Luke goes on to say, A great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered all of the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren of the city, crying out, These two would have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd, and the rulers of the city went uh, when they heard these things. And so when they had heard, had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And the brethren immediately went up, or sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews, and there were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness, Search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also a few of the Greeks and prominent women as well. Now, notice the Bereans were more noble or more fair minded because why? Well, they searched the scriptures daily. They didn't just sit there and say, Well, okay, Paul, uh, here's what you're telling us. You're a, an apostle, uh, so you must know what you're talking about. Okay, we accept it. No, they, they took the scriptures, which would have been the Old Testament, and, and looked through them and said, okay, Paul, we hear what you're saying, but we're going to take what you have to say, and we're going to balance it against the scriptures and see if what you're telling us is, is, is the truth. It didn't also just give opinion. They didn't want Paul's opinion. They were just interested in what uh, the truth uh, of the gospel was. So number one, 
don't be afraid to question preachers. Don't be afraid to question me or anybody else because a preacher who is going to disdain questions about his teaching and subject uh, is probably not as knowledgeable as he likes to think he is. Or maybe um, he's just taking an unhealthy view of leadership. Uh, do not think a preacher has all the answers on all the Bible topics. Even though we've been to school and we've got degrees and some have got PhD and LLD and all that alphabet stuff for their name, you have to remember we're still human. We can still make uh, uh, mistakes too. Plus there's some benefits to questions. I like getting questions because it shows that the audience or whoever's asking questions is thinking and they're paying attention. Because remember, you've got to think if you want to be a Christian. You cannot just check your brain uh, at the door if you're going to uh, just um, uh, come in and sit down and, and not question anything. And if you never ask questions about classes or sermons, that is when I get concerned. Because what that tells me is that uh, you're not really reading, you're not uh, thinking things through really like you should uh, if you're not asking questions. When I hear questions, it means that uh, there, there's some thinking going on. A lot of false teachers, remember, will contradict misleading. False teachers also typically do not want uh, any questions uh, to be asked of them. In verse 2 of chapter 17, notice it says it was custom to go into the synagogues and to reason with them. Uh, some of your uh, older texts might say that uh, Paul argued with them or debated. And then notice that the Thessalonians and the Bereans uh, differed greatly in how they responded. The Bereans listened to what they to say, and then they uh, uh, balance that against scriptures. Paul And how did Paul reason with them? We'll have a look at verse 3. Paul reasoned with them explaining and proving from the scriptures that Jesus had to suffer and rise from the dead. And that was uh, he, and he used argumentation and he used uh, debate. He didn't stand up and rely on his feelings and say, oh, I just feel it in my heart. Uh, he didn't stand up and say, now y'all have to listen to this and don't ask any questions. He reasoned. I just think when you're trying to reason with someone, you will make statements, they'll counter it, you'll ask questions, they counter it, they they ask questions, you go back and forth. And notice the Thessalonians let their prejudices overwhelm the arguments that Paul gave. Basically, they were think, thinking with their emotions. They weren't thinking uh, with their heads. And if you notice in verse 5 that some of them persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas, but the Jews who were not persuaded took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob and sent all the city in an uproar. Now notice they were, they were uh, not persuaded. They were envious. All over here is getting a bigger following than we've got. That can't happen. We can't allow that. So we're going to uh, get some people to basically going to we're just going to create a lot of problems here uh, for Paul because notice they did persuade some of the people uh, to go with them to become Christians. But then they went on to Berea. Notice the difference. The Berean, they didn't start a riot. They didn't start any problems. Instead, what did they do? They examined the scriptures. They sat down and read through them, listened to Paul, asked questions, um, and we're told they were fair-minded or, or noble-minded, depending on your translation, but the results are the same. They were more noble because they received the word with readiness. They came in ready to learn. They searched the scripture. And anytime you go to go in Sunday, to Sunday school, you go to Wednesday night class, you go anywhere, you should come to learn. And I want everyone listening on this broadcast to be a Berean. I want you to to be confident in your own abilities to understand the Bible. I want you to be confident in your abilities to be able to deflect uh, and refute false teaching. Be a Berean. That's how congregations become more confident in their teachings. And think about the situation we're in just in our world today. We need to be that, uh, that the world needs, and we need to do that by being Bereans, by studying and, and being ready to give an answer, because God has the Bible has got the best answers uh, for every question in life that we could possibly have. Now, think about this. If my car's making a noise, uh, I go to the mechanic and he tells me what he thinks is wrong and it's going to cost so much. Or I get house repairs. In fact, right now I've got uh, having some issues with the roof here, so I'm getting estimates and that sort of thing. Uh, you got to think about the fact that your soul is much more important than your car. 
you got to think about that it is much more than your house, even though they're both very expensive. They're not going to get you to heaven. You're not going to go to heaven with your, your uh, Mercedes or whatever you're driving. But you're going to get there by, by delving into scriptures. How many of us uh, m- uh, make sure that what we're taught in church or in Sunday school is doctrinally correct? We'll make sure that the car diagnosis is right or that the, whatever the doctor tells me is right. But are you making sure that whatever you're being taught uh, in the, in the uh, Sunday school room or in the church auditorium or in the sanctuary or whatever it is you call it, are you being sure that what you're being taught there is correct? Are you being sure that I'm telling you what I'm telling you is correct? Don't be afraid to uh, cross-reference. Uh, do not be closed-minded. Always, Stevie always says at the beginning of broadcast, and open our Bibles. So yes, keep your mind open, because how am I going to understand what God wants me to do if I don't ever bother to read read His His Word? How am I ever going to know that this is where it comes down to reading the directions? God has given us uh, His plan. God has given us through the pages of Scripture, but too many Christians are trying to tell God what to do without giving thought to what uh, God wants them to do. And in the world, people want a um, God in their own image, which is what they we get typically. When we, well, the God that I believe in would never do such and such or never do this or, or that. But we have to go back to what God's word is. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, he says, I know the thoughts that I have toward you, the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and not hope. Purpose, remember, is bigger than anything that uh, we want or desire. And without God, we don't really have any purpose in life. You think about it, that's one of why atheism and universalism and things like that are really so hopeless because there's nothing beyond this life. They have nothing to offer, uh, as do a lot of the more liberal churches. And I'll probably say something about that in another lesson on another time. Job 12, we're told that every life lives. Uh, the life of every living thing is in his hand and the breath of every human being. So it's not a fate or coincidence or religion that gives you your breath. You're alive because God created you. God allowed you to be to come into existence. And then in the 119th Psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible, we're told, How can a young man be raised but by taking heed according to your word? And with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. I, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, how do we cleanse our ways? Well, by living according to God's word, is what he's telling us in the Psalms. Simply taking it and doing what it says, which uh, is not being legalistic. I, if you heard Tim's lesson uh, in the earlier segment talking about legalism, it is not legalistic to simply do what God says. In verse 11, your word, he says, God's word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That is how we stay on what is popularly called the straight and narrow. Hide it in your heart, keep it there, use it. Second Timothy chapter three tells us the scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now notice all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word in the Greek literally means God breathed, profitable for doctrine, for proof, and correction. So I need to be taught something. If I'm doing wrong, I need to be reproved, and then I need to be corrected and told how to do it right. That happen uh, in, a, in any sermon or any lesson. One, it's one of those things should happen. A person walks out that they are encouraged to do something. They are or uh, they've learned, at least learned something new. In 2 Timothy 3, we also see that all Scripture, not just some of it, but all Scripture is inspired. Uh, not the pieces we like to pull out of context. Uh, everybody has got their favorite Scriptures, and there's nothing wrong with having a favorite Scripture. But remember, it's got to be used in context. Context is your friend. Never uh, leave home without it. Never get into a Bible study without it. And notice he says it's profitable. The following the Bible is profitable. Now, I know a lot of people like to say how it's outdated and it's archaic, but just stop and think about it. Can you name for me a problem they live in the scriptures, say the Old Testament, that we don't deal with today? Just think about it. My wife said, yeah, I'll give you one. She said, uh, they didn't have cell phones back then. Okay, I'll give you that one. 
they didn't have the problems that we have with cell phones and electronics and things like that. But uh, let's see, we've uh, we've gotten uh, uh, back in, in those days they had people like uh, Saul uh, and uh, Jeroboam and, and various kings who were corrupt, and we've gotten rid of corruption in our government, right? Now, wait a minute, that didn't work. Uh, they had people back there like David. David uh, committed adultery, wasn't faithful to uh, his wife, and we've got marital problems. Oh, wait a minute, we still have people with marital problems. Uh, let's see, we haven't uh, – we've gotten rid of murder and robbery, right? No, wait, we still have those. There is nothing that, we, that the Bible deals with that we don't deal with today. We're dealing with the same problems. We think, though, that we don't need to go back to what it wants us to do. We can solve it on our own. But let's get back to the directions. Let's respond to God's word. Let's do like the Bereans did and respond properly. Listen with an open mind. If you will read the Bible with an open mind, um, you're going to see that a lot of what you've been taught about uh, is inaccurate. Some of it is just outright lies. Uh, notice they were more noble in Berea than the Thessalonians. They received it with readiness of mind. They came ready to learn. Like the, the slide says, if you're looking on Facebook, minds are like parachutes. Uh, they function better when they're open. And the Greek word here for readiness here means they had an eagerness. They had a willingness. They were getting up saying, oh, let's get on down there and see what Paul has to say. Let's get down there and get in uh, to the scripture. This would be like you uh, really wanting to go to your favorite class. Um, you know, I enjoyed history and social studies when I was in school. This would be like me wanting to go to that class because the subject is interesting and I really want to be there. Um, didn't care much for math or science, but I did for other things. Uh, many begin also with their prejudices and biases. Now, before you push those aside, because your biases are going to close your mind. Whether you are an atheist, whether you come from a particular religious background, your biases, whatever you have – cloud your mind sometimes and we have to see through them and many people will just reject christianity out of hand because they don't even want to look at the remotest remotest possibility that the universe did not evolve by chance now i happen to believe that the that the universe was created by god it says in genesis um i don't believe that we just came about by chance and so with that i want to look into and use my mind to try and understand things work. Uh, G.K. Chesterton uh, once said uh, that when men cease to believe the Bible, the danger is not that they will believe nothing. The danger is that they will believe anything. You've got a mind. You, you're going to saw, uh, think about uh, these things. You're going to uh, need to come up with some answers. And then in Acts chapter 17, notice that we have to evaluate with an open Bible and an open mind. Preached in a church one time where I counted starting with about the age of 12 and going up through adulthood, about 60% of the congregation did not bring their Bibles with them. That's pretty bad. That's pretty pathetic. Uh, we go to church, take your Bible. I realize a lot of people aren't doing it with paper and ink anymore. We're doing it on our phones. Uh, I've got several uh, Bibles on my phone. I've got it on my computer. That's fine. But you've got to bring it with you. You've got to delving into it and uh, not just taking whatever – uh, the preacher says as being sound and did not automatically accept what they were told. They, their minds were open, someone said, but they weren't wide open. They were open enough to question what Paul uh, was telling them. And the story is told of a woman named Mary who went uh, to John Knox, who was uh, uh, trying to uh, teach. Remember, Catholicism had a heavy sway in England. But this person, I think her name was Mary, said uh, that she listened intensely to this proclamation of the gospel uh, of faith, and she went to him and said, you interpret the scriptures in one way and the pope and the cardinals in another. Whom shall I believe and who shall be the judge? And then Knox is supposed to have replied, you shall believe God. He speaks plainly in his word and further than the word teaches you, uh, you shall believe neither the one nor the other, neither the nor the reformers, neither the Catholics nor the Protestants. The word of God is plain in itself. And anything you need to do to become a Christian, the, the word of God is pretty pretty plain on that. There are some things that might be a little cloudy, but what do I need to do to be a Christian? What to live a, a godly life day to day? That's all plain. What we need to know is plain. And that's what the Bereans, uh, why they were so much more noble 
uh, the Thessalonians were. They took the plain teaching, and they opened their mind, and they and they followed. When you hear God's word preached, believe it with an open mind. Or it says many of them believed. Keep your mind open. Uh, keep a good, solid inquiry going. And notice there, it's for many of them believed. And whenever you see therefore, you the old line is you got to ask what it's there for. Well, it's drawing a conclusion because of what had happened before. Here's what uh, what the conclusion is: because Paul preached to them and they studied the scriptures daily and and were minded. Therefore, many of them believed because they had that open mindedness that the the Thessalonians lacked. And the clear sequence we see here: truth gets proclaimed. The hearers are pre- listening with open minds, and then they uh, search the scriptures on their own. They don't just take the preached word for it. They go out. They become uh, – years ago, I heard on a, on a medical talk show, to be your own doctor. In other words, don't just take what the doctor says, but ask questions, investigate, and um, get second opinions or third opinions you need to. And that's exactly what you need to do uh, spiritually or religiously is – uh, get uh, second opinions and be your own be your own preacher be your own teacher don't be afraid to ask questions or investigate because stir us to action that's what will stir our hearts um, uh, towards the Lord and towards uh, sound doctrine and a better mind is by thinking and asking questions we'll see you next month on the broadcast thanks a lot once again Stevie for having me if you have any questions don't uh, hesitate to send them to me on Facebook or send them We'll be glad to uh, take your questions and, and answer them. Thanks a lot, Stevie, and we'll see you next month. It ain't all good, but it's going to be good. Because I love him. I'm on it. But I'm doing fine. And I trust him. Everything ain't well, but it's going to be swell. In the fullness of time. Everything's gonna be fine. Whoa, in the fullness of time, everything is alright. Sometimes I feel like I'm a rundown man, but I'm looking up where I know him. I'm trying to be holy. I want to be worthy, so he so will he'll know me. I look around me again, it seems like evil wins. In the fullness of time, I know everything's going to be fine. Oh, in the fullness, in the fullness of time, everything is all right. Well, when things don't move the way you want them to, things that you know want to come to you, find their way to another place. It makes it hard to get fun on your face. You just run.
Radio show. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning in to our radio broadcast this evening. And we certainly appreciate those who've been following our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and also on social media, Facebook Live. I want to thank my co host, Tim Bench, for his lesson on legalism. Certainly appreciate the efforts that Tim gives on this broadcast each month on the show. And that was a great lesson, something that we don't re- really hear too much about legalism. We hear it being talked about. We just don't hear lessons presented on that particular subject. And I certainly appreciate him for giving us that lesson this evening. Also, my co-host Steve Cordo on his subject, cross-reference your preachers. Now, that's a lesson that we definitely needed to hear because everybody needs to think for themselves. We can't put emphasis on this enough. Certainly appreciate the efforts by both of my co-hosts on the Gospel Light Radio Show. We didn't have a question on the show tonight, and Lord say so, we'll try to have a question on next week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just thrilled to be able to bring you a program on a weekly basis. And it's our prayer that the lessons that were given on this radio show have been beneficial to your spiritual lives and your relationship with the Lord has been strengthened because you're not only tuning into this radio show, but you've given yourself over to a study of God's word. I'm your host, Stevie Arbuckle, and I want to say on behalf of my co-host on the Gospel Light Radio Show, we really do appreciate your love and support for these programs. Good night, everybody. God bless you. Beautiful
listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show, episode 195. I'm going home. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home. To see my Lord. Said I'm going home. I'm going home. Said I am going home to see my Lord. Going home. Yes, I am. Oh, oh, oh. One of these moments that won't be long. Y'all gonna look for me. I'll be going on home. I'm gonna fly away to a better place. I can hardly wait. No, 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 going home, hey, yeah, yeah, don't worry about me, y'all, I'm going on home, see the king, whoa, whoa, hey, said I am going home, whoa, yes I am, going on home, see my Lord, one more thing, all of my love ones, going on before,